tough law. I'm not one of those lawyers that may go and meet a judge like Nicodemus at night to say, help me. I fight my own in court frontally. This case is bad, bad, bad. Once you don't agree, I say, take to another lawyer. I'm not going to have blood money on my hands to take on a case that I know is bad, is dead on arrival. So, because no country can survive without the rule of law. It's just not possible. It is our ability to subsume ourselves to the operation of rule of law that makes us different from animals, that removes us from the herbaceous state of nature where life was short, nasty, and brutish. By 1885, Professor A.V. Dicey had already to discuss the concept of rule of law, which, in summary, is subjection of all persons before the law and equality before the law. Whether you be a sovereign, president, head of state, or the transparent wretched of the earth or the hoi polloi, you must be one and the same before the law, before the law, nobles and commoners, slaves and slave masters. Once you begin to distinguish as between categories of people, then there's going to be trouble and anarchy. That was why last year the president missed it when he said national interest, in quote, should be subordinated to rule of law. That was wrong because national interest is defined by every government according to its own blood binoculars, which is normally government interest, not national interest. But the rule of law itself predates man. It started from the Garden of Eden. It was the violation of the rule of law in the Garden, the rule of, law in the garden of Eden that got God angry with Adam and Eve, and he decided to drive them away. Because he laid down some rules, thou shalt eat of all this food, all this fruit, but of that singular forbidden fruit thou must not taste. It is the violation of that rule of law in the Garden of Eden that, that God got angry and he had to drive with them. So making the rule of law central is very important. And uh, the president of IBA was here to, to look at some of these issues. And... Many distinguished panels actually looked at many of these issues very critically. And I think it was a way of driving it home to the present government that you cannot operate outside the rule of law. No matter what anti-corruption you say you want to do, no matter how you say you want to go after supposed enemies of state, you must first and foremost go within a constitutional and legal organogram and regime. Anything outside it then becomes anarchical and it's unacceptable in any constitutional democracy, Nigeria inclusive. But was that point driven home? I mean, I take you back to what you just said about how the president said, made that statement about how um, the national interest supersedes the rule of law. He said that is justification of certain actions of the executive, but also as a foreshadowing for what was to come, which was the rather scandalous removal of the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Walter Nogan, and his replacement by the current CJN, Tanko Mohammed. Um, the Senate Minority Leader raised that point and was quite critical of the MBA and their stance in that matter, or failure to take a stance, and he got rapturous applause as a result of that statement. You buttressed that point. You raised the Pakistani precedents where the lawyers took to the streets because of um, Musharraf's removal yeah. of Chowdhury. Yes. But you were contradicted by um, Femi Falano S.A.N., who made a statement along the lines of the person's morals that it's difficult to don a cape. I'm paraphrasing. This is, I'm not quoting. It's difficult to don a cape for somebody who is, whose morals are not quite up to Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I don't like <clears throat> discussing people, particularly when they are not there. But because we mentioned... Femi Falana specifically. Let me say he was dead wrong. He said that um, Mohammed Chaudhry, the then Chief Justice of, Niger of uh, Pakistan, Pakistan, was not accused of corruption. That is not quite correct. President Pavas Musharraf accused him 
of misconduct and abuse of office. Of office. I do not know what greater elements constitute corruption than abuse of office and misconduct. Femi Palana may have been defining corruption from the narrow perspective of this government that I've seen in the last one and a half years. They think that corruption simply means the giving and taking of bribery. They do not seem to realize that political corruption, prebendalism, cronyism, favoritism, nepotism, they are all even, the, all the all the <laughs> they are even greater forms of corruption. Now, on the night of March 2007, Pakistani lawyers poured on the streets. When the then president, Pervers, um, Musharraf. Musharraf, removed the then chief justice of Pakistan, Mohammed Chaudhry, accusing him of mis gross misconduct and other criminal acts. And the lawyer said, no, you cannot do that without first subjecting him to a proper trial. And they poured onto the streets. For months and months, they literally shut down Pakistan. It, in fact, they had to force the government and the judiciary to bring back the chief justice. Even if you say Onoghen was corrupt, quit in this moment as I'm talking to you, no court of law has tried Onoghen to find him guilty of any crime. Even the Code of Conduct Tribunal, they removed him preemptorily with an ex parte order. Even when the proceedings were still going on and his jurisdiction had been tried, the Court of Appeal, in the case of Justice Onogon versus the CCT and others, actually held that the Court of, uh, Court of Conduct Tribunal was wrong to have ordered Onogon to be removed. So even as we speak, Onoga has never been tried nor convicted of any offense. They forced him out. All they wanted was to force him out of office. And that they have successfully done. Otherwise, why would the Court of Appeal wait for nearly three months before delivering judgment in such a simple matter that they could have delivered judgment from the following? By the time they delivered judgment, almost three months later, it, it was too late. But what but, are our so, chances? So, even if, so my argument is that even if Onoga were accused of corruption, what we are saying is that you must allow him to pass through the due process of law before you can remove him. And the Constitution is clear. Sections 153, 158, 291, 292, 3, pass A and B, section 21 of the third schedule, they are all clear that before you can remove a judicial officer. You must subject him to trial by the National Judicial Council. And that was why the Court of Appeal heard in Erelu Habib, the Supreme Court, as a matter of fact, in Erelu Habib's case, and the Court of Appeal in Ngajewa's case, that you cannot begin to try a judicial officer until he has first been disciplined by the NJC, which is independent, in accordance with the doctrine of separation of powers, ably propounded by great philosophers like John Locke, John Calvin, Immanuel Kant, and most ably propounded in 1748 by Baron de Montesquieu, that the three arms of government must be distinct, different from each other, so that there will be checks and balances. Yes, well, sir, now, you have cited, I have to, I have to follow up, you just cited constitutional procedure. Supreme Court precedents, all of these things should be inviolable. What are our chances as a democracy if people within the legal profession do not seem to grasp these simple concepts, mm. that the ends do not justify the means? Oh, well, what we are seeing, it's not that they do not know. They know. They know. It's just that um, they want to sidetrack the law nicodemously. It's an assault on the rule of law, which was where we started from. It's an assault on the rule of law. It means we are not ready to subject ourselves to principles of good governance and rule of law. Once you subject yourself to rule of law, then you will see that even if you were going to remove an organ, you could still allow the judicial process take its place. But what many of these people believe is what you call uh, mob lynching. 
lynch oh you have accused him of uh, corruption in fact the government their spokesperson like Mohammed, say oh name and shame them but when they have problems Chief. when they have problems they again run Chief. back to the same judiciary Chief. that Chief. they Zuckerman, had denigrated a short break but just before we take that break um what do we do because at the first plenary at the conference you know it was uh it was this issue was a major subject but we'll come back let's take a break first you're still watching the morning show here on RIC. <laughs> and with us in the studio of course is chief michael zekerman uh senior advocate of uh, nigeria Chief was recommend before we took that uh, commercial break uh you had talked about the rule of law you were talking about the code of conduct tribunal the onogan case you know and I uh, wanted to ask you that at the first plenary session, yes, at uh, this year's uh, Nigerian Bar Association conference, uh, this was a big issue, particularly the Code of Conduct uh, Tribunal. Yes, and uh, the title was Code of Conduct Tribunal: A Clash of Judicial and Executive uh, Powers. And yes. you were on that, uh, you know, yes. you were a speaker <coughs> at that, uh, you know, symposium. Now, what is the way forward? Are there likely remedies to ensure that? You know, um, in the light of what you said about separation of powers, that you don't have the executive also, you know, uh, assuming judicial powers and using legal, you know, platforms to, uh, to, to subvert the rule of law. Yes, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Even in our own homes, if your wife and children don't check your excesses, the tendency will be that you will become a dictator, even within your own home. And dictatorship is not necessarily a military dictatorship. It could also come from a so-called democracy. President Saddam Hussein was going for elections, always going for elections in Iraq. Didn't we know that? But he was a dictator, maximum one for that matter, an absolutist. Now, at that first plenary session in which I participated, I describe the Code of Conduct Tribunal as a BAT, a BAT, B-A-T. The BAT will go to the animal kingdom and tell them, I'm one of you, I'm an animal like you. The animals will say, how? You have feathers, you can fly, how can you be an animal? He will bear his teeth and say, look at my teeth, my canines. They are like your own. And really, when you look at the BAT, it has teeth. Like dog, like any. He said, Look at my ears, my pinna. They are like your own. More importantly, look at my mammary glands, breast. A bat has breast. He said, So I'm one of you. Then they will accommodate the bat. Then after that, he will leave and go and meet the birds. Who say, I'm one of you. The birds will say, That's not correct. You are just coming from animal kingdom where you prove that you are one of them. You say, You are joking. I'm one of you. He will say, It's a lie. Let's, let's fly. Because the bat flies like any other uh, bird. So we have a situation where Section 20 of the Code of Conduct Bureau and Code of Conduct Tribunal Act, which is exactly like the fifth schedule, part one, paragraph 15 of the Constitution, setting up the Code of Conduct Tribunal as a court, more like as a powerful institution that could try public officers, strip them of their assets, as forfeit your assets to the government of the Federation, even ban legislators, apart from removing them from holding office for 10 years. But do you know what? Such an organ that is so powerful that is so powerful that can do these things, you will never find it in Section 6, Subsection 5 of the Constitution, which lists out what you call cause of superior jurisdiction, starting from the Supreme Court to the Customary Court of Appeal, and they are out there, Federal High Court, High Court. The National, I mean, the CCT is not there. Even on that Section 318, you will not find the Code of Conduct Tribunal listed there as a superior court of record. That is why the chairman and member do not take the judicial oath. So they are automatically an appendage of the executive, the presidency, who can recommend their removal subject to 
to turn majority vote of the Senate. In other words, the Code of Conduct Tribunal, which performs serial judicial functions, is not subject to the internal control mechanism of the National Judicial Council, NJC, which controls all other courts in accordance with the sections of the Constitution that I had earlier mentioned. You must look at section 153, you must look at 158, you must look at 291, you must look at 292, you must look at pass A and B of, uh, to the third schedule, section 21. And you will find that it is the National Judicial Council that ought to have control over this code of conduct tribunal. Some people have referred to say, oh, after all, the, 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 the code of conduct has said their appointment is like that of judicial officers. They were merely saying, the, the, the law was just merely provided that a member should either be a retired judicial officer or a person that is at par with a judicial officer. That does not make the members judicial officers. That was why in May 2015, the former Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Mahmoud, wrote to the, the, to the chairman of the CCT to say, don't refer or allow yourself to be referred to as justice. They are not justices. So you refer to them as honorables. So we, they are not, therefore, um, uh, cause of superior record. And in fact, in the latest case of the Onoga that we are talking about, the two of them, two cases similar, the cause of appeal was insistent that look, including Saraki's case, which incidentally was decided by Justice Onoga, he said, although you have quasi-criminal jurisdiction, you can do all these things, but you remain an inferior tribunal. No matter how we garnish you, how we dress you in borrowed robes, the no matter how you engage in narcissism, in chest beating, beating in grandstanding, you remain an inferior tribunal. You are never a court of superior jurisdiction. What we therefore need is a serious constitutional amendment, because number one, the Code of Conduct Tribunal, a Bureau and Code of Conduct Tribunal Act, um, having exactly the same constitutional provisions in, um, in, in, part, uh, in, 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 in part 15 of the Constitution. You, you do not do that. You do not make similar provisions, uh, part five, sorry. You do not, fifth schedule, you do not make similar provisions in an act which replicate provisions in a constitution. It is against what we call the doctrine of covering the field. So for you to remove the powers of the tribunal, CCT, for example, you must have to amend that constitutional provision in accordance with section nine of the constitution, which tells us how you can amend the constitution. Therefore, there is the need very urgently to amend the constitution to say, look, we have discovered that you have enormous powers. We will now subject you to judicial control so as to prevent anarchy by making you a superior court of record, which for now it is not. So we are having a body that has so much enormous judicial power that it could even make an ex parte order. Removing a whole chief justice of Nigeria, what order will you make at the end of the trial? If an ex parte order will remove the chief justice. So it is because of that lack of internal control mechanism that made the CCT to go on rampage. Thank and it chief. has to be trammeled. It has Thank to be controlled. You. Okay, Chief. I'd like to move us on to a topical issue at the moment. The front cover of this day today, we are leaving no stone unturned on PNID's $9.6 billion judgment, says federal government. This is a serious case in front of Nigeria right now that's going to affect everyone as it's 20% of our external revenues and the government is taking it seriously as they should. Now, what are our best options in this situation? And I say that because the government is now considering a renegotiation, but it doesn't seem like PNID are really going to come to that table. So what would you say are the best options for Nigeria let, right now? Let, let me support you by saying the government must not leave any stone unturned. I will, always, I will even go further that it must never also leave any stone unstoned. <laughs> <laughs> because we are talking of $9 billion judgment debt. The judgment debt by arbitration was actually $6.6 .6 billion. But 
In 2016, 2017, the government had the opportunity within 28 days to apply to set it aside. They delayed. They did not. By the time they, they tried to do that, the British courts has heard that, no, it was too late. Then they went to a, legal, a, a federal high court in Nigeria and said, set aside, as if that, uh, that judgment there was subject to Nigerian laws. That is why I say it must never, you, they must never leave any stone unturned, and they must never leave any turn on stone. Because $9 billion is about 20% of our foreign reserve. What is our foreign reserve? About 47.65 billion well, Chief, dollars. Chief, we'll need to take now, another short break. Yes. And then when we come back, yes. you know, you would uh, you know, recommend the possible options to the federal government in this matter. We'll take another short break. We'll be right back. You're still watching The Morning Show here on Arise News. Uh, with us in the studio still is Chief Michael Zekome, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Chief, before we went on break, we were talking about leaving no stone unturned and leaving no, no turn on, on stones, stones. <laughs> yeah. with regard to the uh, $9.6 billion, yeah. you know, billion judgment against Nigeria. $9.6 billion judgment is 3.2 trillion naira. The current budget of Nigeria is about 8.67 trillion naira. And Nigeria's entire foreign reserve is just about um, 47.6 billion dollars, where China has about 3.2 trillion dollars as its external foreign reserve, with America coming a distant 18 at 125 trillion, I mean, a billion dollars. Now, this contract itself that led to all this emanated from just a gas project that was to be built in Calabar for 40 million dollars. The question, I see it as institutional failure. I've always clamored for building strong institutions, not strong men and strong women. It is our inability to build strong institutions that continue to afflict us, like the leprosy that afflicted Naman, the leper, before he dipped himself into River Jordan seven times and became cleansed of his leprosy. So, when I had the Minister of Information beating his chairs that Nigeria will not surrender his assets, I was just laughing. These people are not going to say, Nigeria, good morning, sir. We want you to surrender your assets. No. There are ways. We call it writ of fiery fisher, writ of execution. You begin to attach Nigerian properties in the 126 countries that belong to the American uh, Convention, in the entire European countries for as long as Britain is a member of the European countries. The only NMPC access, the only access a judgment debt like that is not allowed to touch is if it has to do with the sovereignty of a country. Let's say, for example, the Nigerian house in London or things where you possess your visa and all that, you cannot touch it. But any other assets they see, they can go after that. So what Nigeria need to do, I do not know the lawyers they use before, who they are using. They must quickly go to court. First, quickly file a stay of execution, which is a way of saying, don't carry out this. Then they must quickly file an action to set aside the judgment itself, if it is not too late. By saying, for example, there was an inherent fundamental error that affected the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, or that the award itself was excessive. But these are very tall orders. That is why a third option may be, hello, you have won this case. We agree we were negligent. Can we negotiate? We don't have this $9 billion to pay you. Can you take uh, X amount? $100 million? Can you take $10 million? Can you take $1 billion? But to, to wish it away offhandedly, as the Minister of Information tried to do, is an aberration. The British courts, European courts are not like Nigerian courts, where others are treated with disdain and utmost levity. And the court will make an order, and the government will say we are not obeying that order because we believe that there is a national interest that is high, a national interest that is higher than a court order. Even after both, both the government and those people had already argued that matter before the court. That is rule of law. You must obey court orders. 
You should don't obey court orders. There's anarchy. There's chaos. People will carry mach machets and cudgels to fight each other because there will be no court there which, which at the end of the day protects the common man and common woman. That is why justice is blindfolded. That woman carrying the sword and the, scale. and the scales, the sword to hack down injustice, the scales to balance justice between whether the weakest or the strongest, blindfolded against blur blurring sirens of power, against authority, against mightiness. So, he, we, Nigeria should not take this matter a lie low, otherwise our fumbling economy will just crumble. We, it will not be depression. It will be acute recession where, 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 where people will, will be queuing up again, as in 1983-84, to be, to be buying bread and milk and eggs as essential commodities, which we called essential that time. Don't think anything is beyond this. Hypocrites. The well, father of mercy was told us, desperate diseases require desperate remedies. This is a time the federal government should rise up and approach this matter with the desperateness Chief or the desperation it requires. Let's talk about something else uh, that came up at this year's uh, MBA conference, which was the presentation of the 130-page report covering six continents that was uh, presented by the IBA president, which is uh, bullying and harassment in the uh, legal profession. Now, I mean, the IBA is launching this campaign, as I said, across six continents. And you have been at the Nigerian bar for a very long time. <laughs> Uh, what, what has been the experience in Nigeria with regard to bullying and sexual harassment in the legal profession? Do we also have lawyers who are rapists, you know, and who need to be uh, identified and named and shamed? And I would not even say it's only within the legal profession. Uh, bullying and harassment is actually within the entire society, not just in America or in Europe or in China or in Indonesia, but also in Nigeria. No, but sexual, sexual, harassment. sexual harassment can come in different ways. It could be true rape, outright rape, where you have to prove what you call rest in rem, that there was penetration. That is why case, cases of rapes are very, very always difficult. very difficult to, to prove. You have to get a witness. I don't know who will witness a person being raped <laughs> and um, to say that, oh, there was, there was a rest in rem, there was penetration. There has to be medical evidence. But beyond that rape, which is physical, there's sexual harassment in terms of being tormented mentally, psychologically. When banks, these multinational banks, these so-called banks that declare hundreds of billions every year or billions of, of naira as, as, as profit and, and as dividends, when you send a young lady who had just finished university to go out there and you give the young lady a target that we want you to raise 500 million naira for the bank in a year what are you telling the lady to go and do how are you going to raise 500 million naira many of them come crying to me i say in fact i asked one of them why don't you go to court he said ah, if i go to court sir, they will sack me I said you can go to court and say, expecting you to raise about 250 million naira in, the, in, in an economy that is prostrate is another way of saying go and commit crime. Go, and go, go to people to, to, to make love to you, to be able to give you this money. That is sexual harassment. A lot of it is from the bank. A lot of, a lot of it is in the ministries. Federal government parastatus. Before you get promotion, which you are entitled to, before you get posted, maybe your husband is somewhere, and you say, hello, my husband is in Abuja. Can you, can you let me still continue to stay with my husband in Abuja? Why are you posting me to Karan Amuda, or to Jibia Magama, or to Agene Bode, or to correct me? You say, well, it's quid pro quo, something for something. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? The language is understood. That is sexual harassment. That is bullying. Such people, such cases should be exposed. Whether it's within the legal profession, the banking profession, within the government, within the security agencies, 
What of IDPs? Or in churches? Where, in churches? Pastors? Uh, pastors? Yep. What of IDPs? <laughs> what of IDPs regardless. where security people have been shown to go after this, this unfortunate, helpless, and hapless Nigerians who have become most vulnerable just because they want to eat? Then you first have carnal knowledge of them. Such people should be brought to book. They should be tried within the judicial process and sentenced accordingly and jailed. I do not believe in mob lynch. I'm not one of those people who believe that, oh, because you have accused a person of a crime, you must quickly kill him without giving him a fair hearing. Evil God himself gave Adam and Eve a fair hearing in the Garden of Eden. He had already seen they committed the offense, being omnipotent, omniscient. And he still asked him, Adam, why, did, why are you eating of this forbidden food? He said, well, the lady, in fact, he had a defense. He pushed it to God. The woman thou created for me, pluck it for me, give it to me, and I eat it. That was his defense. Then he asked him, but why did you do that? It was after hearing from them that God said, I find you guilty. Punishment. Then he, he started outlining the punishment. So um, one person believes that the Nigerian criminal justice system is accusatorial. It is Anglo-Saxon based. It means that your innocence is presumed. It has been encapsulated in section 36 of the Constitution. No right. one shall be convicted until a crime has been proved against him. It is not the French model, which is inquisitorial, where your guilt is presumed and then you are told to prove your innocence. For as long as we have that in our Constitution in section 36, for so long are we going to allow our democracy to work according to rule of law. Democracy is not a, a 100 meters dash race or Ben Johnson or Hussein Bolt. It's a marathon race that requires balancing of centripetal and centrifugal forces that are ever, that are ever at play within the never dynamic society like Nigeria. So let me ask you about the CJN's comments during the NBA conference where he said lawyers, he actually warned lawyers to desist from filing frivolous appeals at the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court and said that they would be punished if they do not desist from this practice. What are your thoughts on that? And also want to take your thoughts on Festus Kayamu um, when he was screened by the Senate. And he said that it's scandalous that Nigeria has only one Supreme Court and proposed the idea that we should have six Supreme Courts whose duties are limited to constitutional or political and electoral matters only? Your thoughts? Yes, I believe that um, it is wrong for a lawyer knowing that certain matters have been settled by judicial precedent. What we call sterile decisis. This is how it was. It was like that. It is today. So it shall be. Then a client comes to you. He said, of being frank with the client, when clients come to me and I look at their cases, I tell them straight away, you don't have a good case here. They say, is there no way you can do it? Can't you? I say, well, I'm 38 years at the bar right now, by, October, by July 10. I don't know how to do it other than go through the normal process of a court of law. I'm not one of those lawyers that may go and meet a judge like Nicodemus at night to say, help me. I fight my own in court frontally. This case is bad, bad, bad. Once you don't agree, I say, take to another lawyer. I'm not going to have blood money on my hands to take on a case that I know is bad, is dead on arrival. So such lawyers are being sanctioned more and more, especially by the Supreme Court, that now award costs. I say, you lawyer, you are the one who must pay this cost because you ought to have advised your client that this case ought not to come here. So frivolous appeals should be discouraged. And that is why the Administration of Criminal Justice Act has now said there are no interlocutory appeals. If you have one, wait until the final decision before you bring it up so as not to stultify justice. Justice delayed. Justice, justice denied. denied. Just as justice hurried is actually, as a matter of fact, also more dangerous than even justice delayed. So if we're it, running out of now, time. When you talk about this onboarding of Supreme Court, you mentioned the first of Kayamo. Like I said, I do not mention people in my... In my talk, I said when we mention a person specifically, he was wrong, dead wrong. This, the American Supreme Court is only one. There are the, every state in the, the 50 states have their own Supreme Court. Then 
on constitutional matters and appeals from those Supreme Court, they go to the American Supreme Court. You cannot unbond the Supreme Court of Nigeria, which is one, a monolithic. And then you begin to have six different Supreme Courts in six geopolitical zones. We are uh, going to have an anarchical situation where you, where somebody thank will run to the Supreme Chief. Court we'll in Northwest to, uh, because he believes that we'll that one will favor it, and that one will run to the Supreme Court in South South. Thank you very much. So, Chief just President. a moment, finally, one statement. We, we